Hi everyone, my name is Jason Hibbets. I work over at Red Hat on our EnableSys admin community. I'd like to thank you for attending and supporting Open Source 101 today. And uh, <clears throat> I'd like to invite you to visit the Red Hat booth after the session, check out our opensource.com community and how you, get in, how you can get involved. If you're not familiar with opensource.com, it's a community publication that accepts contributions from people like you. And for example, you could write about a new technology or a new process that you learned today here at Open Source 101 and how you plan to apply it to work, school, or home. Our speaker is a published author on opensource.com. And now I'd like to introduce you to Jim Salter to talk about the anatomy of open source projects. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the anatomy of open source projects. Jim, we'll hand it off to you. Afternoon, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Jim Salter, as capably introduced by Jason. Um, I am a longtime, I like to call it mercenary sysadmin, IT consultant who works mostly in the small business sector with some mid-market. Um, and if you like today's slides, you can find these and the slide decks for all my presentations at jrs-s.net slash presentations. Are y'all able to hear me? Somebody just said that they think I'm muted. Okay, cool. Looks like it's just you, Joe. <laughs> uh, it's on the address for the slides is on the screen. It's jrs-s.net slash presentations. Um, if you forget the Earl, really all you got to do is Google Jim Salter and you'll find me really quick. <laughs> and then you just got to figure out how to put presentations on the end of it. All right. <clears throat> We pretty much just already covered this. Uh, in addition to being a small business consultant, I develop when I absolutely have to. Uh, I like to call that developing at gunpoint when necessary. Um, I am a huge open source hippie, and I founded two relatively popular open source projects, Sanoid and NetBurn. Um, Sanoid is really easy to Google. NetBurn, not so much so. Uh, Sanoid is a ZFS snapshot management system. Are you talking to me or are you talking to the audience, Jason? <laughs> this whole virtual presence thing is uh, new. Anyway, Sanoid manages ZFS snapshots, and NetBurn is the tool that I use for my uh, Wi-Fi testing at Ars Technica, Small Net Builder, and elsewhere. I should probably swap my window so it doesn't look like I'm just staring off into the distance all the time. Sorry, folks, we are all just kind of having to get used to this whole virtual thing. All right, the first thing that we ought to talk about with open source projects is that open source does not just happen. Um, you really need to plan it. A lot of commercial companies on down the line have decided that they're just gonna kind of throw their code over the wall uh, for an existing project that started out not being open source and it doesn't usually go well. They don't have the infrastructure that they need to have a successful open source project um, they don't have the community that they need. And when you just chuck code over the wall after you've finished developing everything without anybody's input, a lot of the time it ends up not really being something that other developers want to work on. And it's a little too late in the process to include them. So if you want to create an, OS, an open source project, there's four things you need, an idea, a license, a community, and a code base. And I want to stress here, it's in that order. Uh, just like we talked about with the folks that, you know, have a commercial project and they just kind of throw the source code over the wall eventually, um, writing code should be the last step. For the idea, usually it's something that, you know, it's a need that you have yourself that, uh, you know, you haven't found a really good fix or a satisfying fix for anywhere else. Um, sometimes it's, and it's just NIH syndrome, which you're not familiar is not invented here. And that's not necessarily a terrible thing. Even if there is some other project that exists and it does what you need well enough, but you know, you just really have the urge to roll your own. Well, the world may or may not need another one, but it's still a really cool thing for you to try doing it and, you know, just kind of experience the whole process. You never know, along the way, you may end up creating a better fix for somebody's use case than anything that did exist out there, and maybe it'll be yours. You're right back to scratching an itch. It is almost always an itch, a real itch, behind a successful open source product, though. Uh, 
Um, I love this GIF. I hope it's rendering in close enough to real time for you folks that are watching. Um, if you can't see it very well with the animation, it is a cow loving up on an automatic grooming tool. And uh, if cows could build things, some cow would absolutely have developed an open hardware project based around that. All right. We covered this. We're going to cover it again. Don't just immediately start writing code if you want to have an actual open source project. Now, if all you really want to do is you want to write some code and you're like, well, it's cool if other people have access to it too, then that's fine. And maybe you can just go ahead and get started. But if you ever want to have a real community, don't write too much code until you've started talking to your potential community and you know figuring out what they want and getting ideas from them. Uh, before we go on, I, I want to cover this a little bit more. One of the reasons that you want to talk to a community first is a lot of the time you may have one really good use case for yourself, but if you just write code to address your own use case, what you frequently end up doing is you create an unnecessarily limited project. Um, it might not have been that hard to create a broader project that can be used for a lot more situations than you had in mind originally when you wrote it. And if you talk to a community and you solicit some feedback, you may find a lot of those other applications out really quickly early in the process. And it might not be that much more work to create your project for that larger audience and so that it can be used in a whole lot of different ways. Getting that right is going to be crucial to getting that actual community to help you further down the road. Again, if all you care about is writing your own code for you, you're free to ignore all this. But... If a few years down the line, you want to be in the kind of situation that, well, I'm in now, where I rarely even have to write any new code for my own open source projects because there's a thriving community that's actually submitting pull requests and writing code. And all I really need to do is, you know, address those pull requests and, you know, answer a few questions. And I've got really good developers that are adding functionality to my own project that in some cases I never dreamed of. And in other cases... I just didn't have enough of a get a crap to get around to. Well, that's the kind of thing that you need to have this broader design scope for. And I'm telling you, you're not going to figure it all out on your own. You need to talk to that community. Now, beyond the idea, before you start public, well, you know, you can write some code first, but before it ever hits the internet, you have to decide on a license. This is really important, and it's important to think about upfront. Um, you know, if the only code that's in your project is your own personal code, you can relicense that anytime you want. Now, if you decide to go with a more restrictive license than the one that you started out with, uh, you can do that, but you can't put the genie back in the bottle as far as people who, you know, got a copy of your code earlier when you had the more permissive license, they retain those rights and there's nothing you can do about it. As far as going more permissive, well, certainly you can do that anytime you want to. And so far, all this is fine when you're the only code author. But what's going to happen if you've done this right is you're going to start getting community submissions. Once you get those community submissions, it becomes a lot harder to change that license. Because now, whether you want to go more restrictive or even less restrictive, if the other license you choose isn't broadly compatible with the first one, you're going to have to get buy-in from every single person who ever contributed code to the project and you accepted it. Or alternately, um, you're going to have to dike out every contribution where you can't reach that author and you can't get their explicit permission. That's really, really difficult. Um, I would also recommend not getting too fancy with your license. There are, I, I literally can't count the number of potential licenses there are out there. There's a, uh, somewhere between 50 and 100, even OSI approved licenses. But the majority of them, you really shouldn't even be looking at them. Uh, if you want copyleft, which means you want to make sure that everybody retains as much freedom with the project as they had when you contributed to it. They get to have the same freedoms to share it and to alter it and to redistribute it, regardless of whether it's just your code or other developers' code added into it, no matter who forks it the GPL is going to be the answer for you. Now, there's two cases there, the GPL v2 or the GPL v3. And mostly the difference between the two has to do with patents. The GPL v3 offers, uh, you know, it, it offers users and redistributors uh, freedom from you using any patents you own to uh, sue them for royalties. And the GPL v2 just ignores patents entirely. For most people, 
I would recommend the GPL V3. Now, if you're more of a permissive type and you want the ability to just redistribute the code anywhere, you want anybody to say, hey, they can do basically anything with it. They can license it with a different license, even including proprietary. Usually I would recommend the Apache license for that. Although again, you've got lots of options. There's also all the BSD licenses. Finally, you get folks who are like, well, I just want to put my code out there in the public domain. And the answer to that is you can't you actually don't get to control what's in the public domain. The public domain, <laughs> it's really complicated, but legally in most jurisdictions, it belongs to the government, not to you. Therefore, you don't get to determine if your stuff is in the public domain or not. And public domain also means something different in every different jurisdiction. So if you just say my code is public domain, it's not really safe to use. Um, Luna, your question, is it owned by the copyright holder? Your code, the code is always owned by the copyright holder. It's the license for people beyond the copyright holder to use it that we're talking about. All right, so now a lot of folks, and usually it's the same folks that want to just say, oh, my stuff is public domain, or they just don't bother putting a license file at their GitHub at all. Uh, they say it's boring and it's fine. If that's your position, I strongly recommend I strongly recommend you just use the BSD zero clause license. In earlier versions of this talk, and I think if you download the slides, slides right now from my website, because like Jason said, I was editing it right up to the minute, um, I used to recommend the unlicensed or the WTFPL. Um, the WTFPL is hilarious, and it is an OSI approved license. Uh, it stands for, we'll just say, what the frick public license. And it does exactly what you would think. It just says, do whatever the fudge you want to with this code, it's fine. And that is actually OSI approved. It's far better than using public domain because it has legal meaning and it will work. Uh, the unlicensed is a little bit more professional sounding and does exactly the same thing. I used to recommend it, but unfortunately it's not OSI approved. It's the Open Source Institute. So the BSD zero clause license is the only public domain like license that does exactly what you would expect. Just do whatever you want. Doesn't matter. There's no writers. You are free to use it, redistribute it, whatever, however. And it's the only way to do that that's approved by the OSI, which can be important because a lot of the time uh, you may encounter royalty grants, uh, patent grants, project funding that is tied to being an open source project, which in turn is often tied to using an OSI approved license. So if you just don't care and you just want people to do whatever, use BSD zero clause. And that way, at least you won't be screwing yourself out of potential funding or patent immunity or whatever down the line. Uh, I would use BSD zero over MIT for permissive, Ricardo, because uh, while the MIT license is very popular, uh, just saying MIT license is also very ambiguous. There have been a bajillion different variations of them over the years. And admittedly, if you link very specifically to the exact version of the MIT license you want, then that doesn't necessarily matter. But if you're ever in the slightest sloppy about that, it's you can't really be certain what kind of MIT license you meant. I see somebody saying they can't find the WTFPL on the OSI site. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, really, it just boils down to use BSD zero clause. Uh, it's OSI approved and it doesn't have WTF in the name. So what's not to love? All right. So... Um, I really think even if you think right now that this project is just for you, you should absolutely plan to have a community eventually. Um, you may be surprised in that you actually get one. Um, I've written, <laughs> right, Ruth. I've written a lot of code over the years and I've open sourced a fair amount of it. But, um, you know, the first time that I really planned for a community around one, I didn't expect anything to happen. And to my great surprise, it did. And it's been amazing. And it's been a game changer. And even if you don't actually get the community ever, you know, actually congregating around your new project, and it remains really just kind of being your own personal hobby. It's a growth experience. And if you actually plan for the community, you will learn from that. And there are lessons that you'll be able to take to later projects in your career. <laughs> 
the first thing really about planning for the community is you need to publish your code where there can be a community. Uh, you may be tempted just to put a link to your raw source code on your own personal WordPress blog or static site or however it is you happen to roll. Um, the problem with that is that there's not much way for people to actually interact with you and your code there. I strongly recommend picking a vendor. There are lots of them out there. Uh, Bitbucket, GitLab, and GitHub are three of the most popular. Um, start your project on one of those sites. Uh, the, lots, I mean, we're talking, you know, millions of people have accounts with these sites and the community integration is already built in. You get a free bug tracker, you get your concurrent versioning system, which usually is going to be Git these days. You hope it's going to be Git these days. Um, you know, you've got your versioning history. People can open tickets. They can make requests. You can discuss, you know, potential changes to the code you're going to make. These are all things that you're not realistically going to be able to spin up on your own site. Now, there's a little bit of an exception there with GitLab because, you know, GitLab is entirely open source itself. And you can, in theory, just stand up your own entirely separate GitLab instance on your own hardware. Um, I really generally wouldn't recommend that either. The problem, again, is it's going to be more difficult to find the people that you want and kind of get them brought in to your own personal GitLab instance since you're not at that kind of you know central congregation point where developers are likely to actually see and already have accounts and be able to interact with your project. I really think this is crucial. All right. And uh, wow, we are just rolling way ahead of time. This is actually the last slide, so we're going to have tons of time for questions here. Um, the case study here is my own Sanoid project. Um, I started this one in 2014. Uh, and this was another one of those cases where I really truly had my own itch to scratch. Um, my business and the local side of my consulting business largely revolves around making things work for small businesses in the South Carolina area. And uh, not to put it too bluntly, Windows just sucks. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many hours of my life I devoted to dealing with malware problems or, you know, servers that didn't want to boot after a bad patch Tuesday. Uh, you know, the next time they booted after a Windows update, something just didn't work. Something blue screened. It was a nightmare. And, you know, once I got familiar with virtualization and once I got familiar with the idea of, you know, having my virtual machines on a ZFS file system where I could just have automatic rolling snapshots of them. And if something didn't boot or something got malware or whatever, you've got that option to just instantly roll back to a prior snapshot, reboot the VM. And, you know, you've, you've time traveled, like everything's fixed. You've gone back to before the problem happened. I had to have it. Now I had started doing that sometime in late 2011 or early 2012, but um, I was doing everything just with, you know, cron jobs. Uh, I would have a cron tab and I would have, you know, an hourly job to take hourly snapshots and a daily job to take daily snapshots. And, uh, you know, that would just kind of do its thing. And every once in a while I would shell in and delete old snapshots. And for the most part that worked, but it got to be a really big problem as the scale of my business grew because taking the load off of myself of having to like, you know, manually do this kind of surgery to repair broken windows servers it actually enabled me to take on a lot more customers and to do a lot more things for the customers that I had. And as I did that, I ended up now frequently, I might have 10 or 20 VMs on the same physical server for the same customer. And now instead of, you know, two or three cron jobs to take snapshots for two or three VMs, it would end up where I might have 10 pages of cron job. And you have to remember to add all these, you know, individual jobs to your cron tab for each new VM as you add it. And it became really, really easy to accidentally screw up and not realize that you'd missed dotting an I or crossing a T until a few months down the line when you need a snapshot and you're like, yikes, this might not have, have gone well. Um, so Todd Lewis, the, uh, the fine gentleman who's actually putting on open source 101, he basically pinned me up against the wall and said, Jim, I know you feel like this is good enough for you the way you're doing things as it is but you have got to turn this into a project. You've got to write a proper application to do all these things and do them the right way and make it all easier. And, you know, for like six months, I resisted him because it sounded like a lot of work, frankly. But finally, I was like, okay, Todd, all right, 
I took my family down to uh, my mom's house in Mississippi at the time. And my wife and my mom and her husband dealt with kids. And I just barricaded myself in the dining room with a laptop and spent like three days writing the first beta version of Sanoid. And it did all the things in one place. You could write one simple config file that would manage all of the VMs on a host according to the same policy, or you could have multiple policies for different VMs. You could group them. And I was like, well, that's really neat. And I started using it in production, but I thought, I mean, my old way was fine. But I discovered that just like relying on ZFS and snapshots in the first place had taken so much workload off of me that I hadn't realized um, doing automating everything with Sanoi did the same thing by making it so much cleaner. And happily, because it was Todd who had pushed me back up against the wall and forced me to do this thing, Todd being you know somebody who's running an extremely successful open source conference with a lot of eyes on it, I told myself, well, I'm going to do this right. I'm not just going to barf code over the wall. Um, I'm going to start doing lots of commits really early in the process. When people come to the project, they're going to see a big commit history on GitHub before even the first 1.0 goes live, even before it's all working. They're going to see me committing the code as it's developed in little bits and pieces and commenting on it and asking for requests. And it worked. All right. So starting with questions, uh, Blake asks, do you recommend eventually making a website for your project? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, now you can get away with just really, you know, peeking and tweaking your GitHub website. Um, you can actually create a simple website on GitHub using the Markdown language. But yeah, I think it's a really good idea to, I mean, domains are pretty cheap these days. Um, I wouldn't even say that's an eventually. I would say that's a right away. Uh, if you think that your project is at all likely ever to be an important thing, then you know, go ahead and brainstorm with a few friends on a good domain name and uh, head on down to Namecheap or the registrar of your choice and find the best version of that domain name that's available and register that thing right away. Don't wait. Um, if you come up with a good idea for a domain name and you wait, what you'll likely find is that, you know, it may even just be a month later, somebody has snapped that thing up and maybe they're actually using it or maybe they're just hoping to extort you out of a bunch of money to get it so that you can use it. Sidestep all that, plan on paying your 10 bucks a year and just go ahead and get a domain name first. Similarly, Standing up a WordPress site is not all that hard. Um, yes, I would definitely recommend doing that. If not right away, then very soon in the process. Uh, it definitely helps to have that kind of discoverability. Just make sure that on your site, you can do a lot of neat things like, you know, embed videos or, you know, blog about your project or whatever that's more difficult to do on GitHub, but absolutely link directly to your project on GitHub very prominently. You wanna funnel as many people there as you can so that you get that real community built, not only of users, but of developers, and both are important. Um, I didn't say that earlier, but yeah, getting a lot of users is, I would almost say it's more important than getting a bunch of developers, because when you've got a lot of users, they're gonna discover use cases that you didn't think about they're gonna discover bugs that you maybe never would because your own use of the project is so narrow, you just don't encounter them. It's gonna make your project a lot stronger. Just getting bug reports, as annoying as some of them may be because you're like, oh, this is a dumb user error, they will help you out. Um, it will teach you the weak spots in your application that you hadn't thought about. It will also teach you, if you don't already have them, the skills for you know how to politely and friendly and professionally interact with users. And again, it's a really good thing for your career down the line. Next question from Michael, similar to Blake's question, any recommendations or thoughts on good ways to start communicating once a project outgrows its issue tracker or wiki? Um, so in addition to you know bringing up your own site, Reddit can be great for this. Um, you can create your own subreddit for your project if you think that it's a, a broad enough topic to be worthwhile. Or you may just, you know, start becoming a very active presence on a related subreddit. So, for example, I haven't created an R Sanoid on uh, on Reddit yet, but um, I did start posting and uh, answering questions very actively in RZFS, and I think that has been, you know, a big contributing factor in driving both users and developers to the project itself. Jason, is it a requirement for an open source project to have a strange name? 
No, um, it's definitely not a requirement. Um, real question, what are some things to consider when naming a project? So there are a couple of schools of thought here. Um, when you talk to branding people, one of the first concepts you'll encounter is, you know, professional branding and marketing people will tell you explicitly, don't name your project after the things that it does because that limits the that limits your ability to brand it because they're generic terms and also it may limit people's perception of the scope of your project maybe it's good for more things than just the descriptive name that you gave it um there is also the competing school of thought that if you name your project something just flamingly weird and generic like a lot of the marketing folks very literally want you to do give it a name that doesn't mean anything so that it doesn't limit you down the road when people see that project they don't have any idea what the heck it does. So if you're going to give something some really generic or bizarre name that has nothing to do with what the project does, you'd better really be on point with the rest of your marketing in driving people to not only see the name, but also see a description, see an example of the project in action, get them associating this weird name that you made up with the actual function of the project. Um, you should also, you know, I mentioned do that domain name search like really early on. Uh, ideally, you want the whole thing to happen before you ever go public with a project at all. You want to be thinking about names. You want to be checking those names for domain name availability. You want to see if you can pick something that has a really good punchy domain name uh, with the project's name and ideally a .com. If you can't get the .com, then at least a really well-recognized domain name like... Uh, I'm pretty fond of .NET personally. Uh, technically, .NET is supposed to just be like for ISPs and network hosts, but in practice, I find that it ends up being a, a pretty good top-level domain that people aren't going to flub or forget too badly, at, at least now, uh, although there was a time that they would, and it's frequently available where the .coms aren't. If you're not ready to come off a ton of cash, it may be impossible to get a really good related .com to your project name and you end up either having to come up with one of those marketers ideas of just a really goofy name that means nothing that hasn't been seen anywhere else, in which case you should be able to grab the .com um, or settling for some variant of that in a domain name and dealing with any ambiguity there. Yeah, it does help. Ruth says it does help if people are Googling. Um, I assume she means to have, you know, a unique name. Um, so part of this consideration went into my own name uh, for my Sanoid project. It didn't start out being Sanoid. It went through several different potential names first. Uh, the first one was a, uh, a three-letter acronym that started with Z because, sure, that'll have something to do with ZFS, but you can't get three-letter domains anymore without spending, you know, literally, I don't even know how much. It used to be thousands. I'm sure it's like hundreds of thousands of dollars now. So that wasn't a good choice. It also didn't really roll off the tongue very easily. Um, then after that, I had uh, I, my the the ZFS replication part of the Sanoid project, which is the tool Syncoid now. Originally, the first version of Syncoid was named ZF Sync, and I thought that was very clever. You know, ZF Sync, ZFS, eh, it's all good. But um, when I had to come up with the name for the snapshot management portion of the project. I started thinking about things that would make sense, but you didn't see anywhere else. And, you know, it's kind of like a SAN, a storage area network. The whole concept of the project is you're making something that uh, it using it is a lot like using and configuring what might be, you know, in some cases like a multi-million dollar SAN device. Um, but it's not quite that. It's something different. So SAN OID. And when I Googled SAN OID, there was one prior use, but the prior use was like, I think World War One medical tins that like, <laughs> you know, a few hundred people in the world are very, very serious about collecting these things, but like they're the only ones. So it was a good combination for my purposes of name visibility and not too much name confusion. So I jumped on it. Um, Luna asks, is .org not good for open source projects? Uh, .org is fine for open source projects if that's where you want to go. Um <sighs> I think people tend to, at least in the past, people didn't really seem to understand .org as well as .com and .net. 
Um, and sometimes you'll get purists saying you you should not ever be allowed to use .org if you ever plan to make money from a thing that you're doing. And even if your project is open source, you may very well plan to make money on it. Um, I mean, Red Hat Enterprise Linux is open source, but Red Hat makes a ton of money from it. They sell licensing and they sell support contracts. And uh, all this technically makes it theoretically not applicable for .org. Now, in practice, there's no law against using .org for whatever you want. But you will find purists who will pin you in a corner and get pedantic about it otherwise. So I just kind of prefer to avoid it, honestly. Okay, Nick, sorry, I, I, I promise I was getting back to you if, uh, <laughs> although you just scrolled your question off the screen. Okay, uh, you mentioned Bitbucket, GitLab, and GitHub as places to host the code and start the community. Any thoughts on choosing which one to use? Um, for me, honestly, personally, it's a no-brainer, GitHub you have absolutely the biggest potential single audience there. Um, and it's free as in beer and easy. So it's a no brainer click button, go there for me. If you're more of an open source purist, you may prefer GitLab because the GitHub site itself is not open source. And there can be some issues with exporting the entire functionality of your GitHub project out of GitHub. Now, it's super easy to get the code repository out of there, but, you know, getting the entire history of people's comments and, uh, you know, the bug tracker and everything else, I'm not entirely sure where that stands right now. In the past, it's been a little bit iffy. And, of course, some people, although at this point, I don't think it's entirely fair, some open source purists will just immediately say, well, Microsoft bought it, so I want nothing to do with it. Um, I'm not going to pretend those folks don't exist. Um I don't think that's entirely fair, but if you feel that way, then there's always GitLab and Bitbucket. I think GitLab would be my definite number two. It's entirely open source. It's very similar to GitHub, and uh, you can get your project back out. You can self-host your own project entirely if you want to get away from the centralized Git GitLab hosting. Um, it's a real easy answer. Bitbucket, honestly, I don't know that much about it. I just know that um, as far as I can tell, it would be the third of the top three. and Three choices seemed like a nice, well, round's not the right word, but nice common number. So there we are. All right. Uh, Kimla, I'm sorry if I'm butchering your first name. Should you have a list of the type contributors you need? Tech writers, developers, project managers, BAs, et cetera. Um, that's not a bad idea to start out with. I think um, you need whoever you can attract and the main value in such a list is for your own use to make sure that you're not forgetting somebody because all those type people can help you out greatly. As your project matures, you may have a better idea of where its weaknesses are. Maybe you're not very good at writing documentation or you just don't want to and you would really love to attract a very good technical writer to help you out with that. Uh, maybe there are features that you know would make your project stronger, but you're either unable to code them yourself or, again, just don't have the time or the desire to, so you might want developers. Ultimately, um, if your project's going to be really popular, you can use help on everything, so just try not to leave anybody out, basically. If you're a benevolent dictator, Joan asks, with a germ of an idea that you want to develop before getting additional ideas, should you wait before trying to build a community? Um, the, there's not one simple, easy answer to that, Joan. Um, I, I certainly have sympathy for the idea of being a benevolent dictator. Um, I frequently kind of think of myself that way. The issue with being a benevolent, benevolent dictator is very commonly what you end up being is a benevolent or not roadblock to progress, which may be okay. Um, if, if you're okay with that and you just want to make sure you've got complete tight control of the project under the branding, that's fine. But the one thing I would really caution people to think about in terms of deciding, do I want to be a benevolent dictator? Do I want this to be more open? Is because it's open source, you know, if your project really takes off and gets really popular and it goes in a direction that you don't entirely love, that's okay too, because you can always fork it yourself. You can either fork it privately for your own consumption to just do things the way that you want to do them and, you know, not have the community's extra stuff involved. Or you can fork it publicly and think, well, maybe this is good. There's a big community and they clearly like this, but I think maybe this isn't serving my original idea of a core community as well as I want. Well, you can still fork and do that as well. 
um, nobody really has to lose there. So I would really kind of recommend opening yourself up to community involvement early. You don't have to do everything the community asks, but it's good to at least get yourself exposed to the ideas, I think. Uh, Luna says GitLab is not fully open source if you don't host your own instance. Um, okay, fair. Uh, as far as I'm aware, though, you absolutely can still host your own instance and uh, migrate the entire functionality of your GitLab hosted project into your own site. It may just not be quite as pretty. Um, if somebody knows better than I do about that, I'm certainly open to comments. I'm not personally a GitLab user, so we're just going on a couple hours of, of light research and what I hear people talking about there, basically. Uh, Menaranjit, I hope I'm pronouncing that vaguely correctly. What are your thoughts on open source projects combining hardware and software like Arduino? Um, that's a really broad question. I don't really know how to answer that other than I love it. I think it's great. Um, I think if you can design hardware and, you know, open source the plans for the hardware and allow direct community involvement and improvement and potentially forking, I think that's amazing and you should do that and you're helping the world. Uh, beyond that, it's a little too broad really to say much about it. Um, yes, Manaranjith, I, I think the same strategies are applicable. I don't think there's much different... Um, the only thing that might be a little bit different is you might need to consider patents even more strongly than you consider them with a software only uh, project. You may have to consider that both in terms of, well, I want to get a patent so that I can charge royalties. You may also want to consider it in terms of, I may need to file defensive patents because particularly when it comes to hardware, you're in a lot more danger potentially of if you don't file for a patent, um, particularly in the United States, I don't know about other countries, but our patent office is really pretty horrible and they are very bad about both not granting patents that they should and granting patents that they absolutely never should have. And the last thing that you want to happen is to come up with this amazing hardware design, publish it openly, and then have some other company take your design, make a couple of tiny changes to it, file for a patent that you never did, be granted that patent and immediately hit you with a cease and desist or an ask for an inordinate amount of royalties. That could happen. So if you're considering doing any kind of a hardware project, honestly, open source or not, I would strongly advise you to talk to a competent patent attorney to discuss the issues and whether or not you can afford to or should or should at least consider filing for patents. Uh, Luna says, I just go with something I heard in late night Linux today. Um, <laughs> not sure how accurate it is. And I love late night Linux. Uh, I'm a listener too, but I haven't listened to today's yet. So I have no idea what that is. Um, and I'm afraid to click it right now because I've got too many <laughs> windows open and I'm not sure what will get shared or what I just won't be able to see. Luna, can you expand on that? Uh, Manranjith, as far as your question about less expensive, uh, ways to protect yourself from being sued on a hardware design than patents, um, publishing extremely widely, uh, as many places as you can is probably your best defense because technically, um, you know, prior art is a defense against being sued for a patent. It's how you would invalidate a patent. The problem is that while, you know, publishing, does mean that you have shown prior art and in theory that should invalidate a patent. If somebody has actually gotten a patent that they shouldn't, you're not going to be able to invalidate that patent without actually winning a lawsuit in court. And that's liable to be more expensive than just doing a defensive filing for the patent would have been in the first place. Um, I think you can very likely manage to get a defensive patent for something fairly simple filed with a local attorney for something in the order of a few hundred bucks, um, it, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, if you, if you're not willing to do that, I mean, I understand not having a few hundred bucks to spend, but that few hundred bucks may be a hedge against you having to spend tens or maybe even hundreds of thousands in a protracted lawsuit to try to invalidate that patent later when they nail you with a cease and desist. It's, it's ugly, but it is what it is. Um, also I am not a patent attorney. Uh, this advice is correct and relevant to the absolute best of my knowledge, but consult a patent attorney. Okay, 
Gills uh, mentions that CERN has actually created an open hardware license. So I certainly recommend that you look into that. That's a good point. I hadn't even addressed like types of licenses for open hardware. And yes, you should Google those and look into them. I haven't personally designed hardware, so I'm not as familiar with the open hardware license choices as I am with software. Absolutely look for what people are doing. And if CERN did it, it's probably a, a really good start. Deb says defensive publications, like I said. And yeah, that's that's a good way to make sure that you have the ability to invalidate a patent due to prior art later. It's just the actual process may end up being really expensive. Um, all right, does anybody else have any questions? We have, I think, 10 minutes left. These have been really great questions, by the way, folks, and I appreciate you asking them. Uh, I had forgotten when when Todd asked me to put this talk on, I had forgotten that when I originally did the talk, it was scheduled for, for a 20 minute like mini presentation time slot. I had forgotten that entirely. So I wasn't really prepared for this deck to not get me through a, a full length talk. Uh, Damien asked, I do anything specific to grow the Sanoid project. And honestly, the specific things I did are like this entire talk. I planned for the community from the get-go. I started a GitHub project before I even had any actual code. Um, I, as I wrote the code, I committed it piece by piece, even before the whole thing was working to GitHub so that there would be a history. Um, I opened tickets against my own code that only I had written. And as far as I knew, only I had ever seen. It kind of gives the whole thing a much more lived in and approachable look and lets people know that you're serious about the actual concepts of community and you're prepared for the idea of people putting in tickets and you responding to tickets and taking pull requests and the whole nine. Um, beyond that, I don't know. Um, I, I'm, I was lucky enough to already have a, a reasonable amount of visibility when I started this project. I had begun speaking at open source conferences and I had been invited on a couple of podcasts and I wrote, you know, the occasional article for opensource.com. I should mention that specifically. I mean, if you build a really cool open source project, once it's actually working and it does a thing that you think is really neat in a way that maybe no other project is doing right now, pitch the fine folks at opensource.com about writing an article about your project. There's never any guarantees, but they may very well say yes and they're not going to pay you any money for that. But, you know, if they say, yes, we'd like to host that, then you get to write that article. You get the exposure of being on opensource.com. You've got a thing you can tweet about and blog about and link to. And also you get some good experience in being a for the public technical writer, which can be helpful. Uh, Jason says it would be good for folks here to hear about when you should consider moving the project to a foundation. Um, I think you're exactly correct, Jason. That would be a great thing to hear. And I would love to hear it too, because I've started wondering when it's time to move Sanoid to a foundation and out from another out under my benevolent, you know, dictator thumb. And I don't know the answer yet. I'm still just in the stages of thinking about that. Um, I think certainly by the time you realize that your benevolent dictatorship is starting to become a roadblock, that you're doing less, uh, of a value add in terms of directly authoring features and in terms of guiding and shaping contributions and adding quality of pull requests. Um, if you discover that you're getting in the way more than you are contributing, you should definitely think about moving things to a foundation. You should, and again, remember moving things to a foundation doesn't mean that your project can really be taken away from you because if it goes in a direction you don't like fork it and do your own thing again. But I think the odds against that are pretty good, really. Deb says when you're going to pay people for work is a big step as far as moving to a foundation. Cool thought. I have, I've certainly thought about just kind of randomly throwing, you know, some money as I can afford it to some of the developers on Sanoid, just as a thank you. I don't really have honestly a, uh, a good like cash flow model there. I thought about I had originally planned on, uh, you know, kind of spinning up a whole business model, kind of in the red hat sense with paid consulting behind Sanoid, but I was never really capitalized well enough for that or honestly interested enough in it to do that. So that kind of got away from me. Uh, yes, that's correct. Jason did not pay or even mention me about praising opensource.com. Uh, 
But um, opensource.com, I think, was probably crucial to, you know, me getting started with my writing career. Uh, if you're not familiar, I write um, mostly every day when I don't get my head buried too much in the sand for a really deep feature for ArsTechnica.com. And um, I don't think that ever would have happened if I hadn't had some practice and some exposure writing for opensource.com first. I recommend blogging to everybody, do some technical writing on your own blog, make it as accessible for other people as you can. And then the next step behind that is going to be, yeah, start making pitches to opensource.com. Uh, read articles there, see what the style is like, what they're about, what they do. Get on the opensource.com mailing list. Uh, Jen White Huger will give you great ideas about the kind of content that they're looking for. Maybe you can take one of those and run with it. And then maybe eventually you can write about your own project. It's great career experience. It's great exposure. Deb says companies like to pay to incorporated entities, not individual PayPal accounts. That's a great point. Um, and to that point, even before moving to an actual foundation, uh, the details are going to be different uh, from country to country and from U.S. state to U.S. state. But I actually own multiple LLC corporations. They cost about 200 bucks a pop and take about a half an hour to file for in South Carolina. Um, it's usually a pretty similar situation in most U.S. states. Um, once money gets involved in any way, and maybe even before that, you should seriously consider incorporating because above and beyond people just liking to pay corporations, um, incorporating also protects you in the sense that if a corporation owns the project instead of you personally, even if you're the only person that owns the corporation, it insulates you from any potential nuisance lawsuits down the road because they can't attach your personal assets, only things that belong to the corporation. Um, yeah. Ruth says her project used the software Freedom Conservancy as a host, and they are in the process of an amicable divorce now. I haven't worked with the Freedom Conservancy, but um, I know some of the folks there, and they're certainly good people. I think we're technically out of time. Um, like, I think the hallway track started at 2.45. If anybody else has more questions, I don't mind hanging around and answering them. All right, folks, um, it looks like the questions have pretty much died down, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. If you'd like to get hold of me, um, I can always answer more questions for you later in a different venue. Um, I'm going to leave this slide up for a while, leave my screen shared. You can see my Twitter handle, at JRSSNet. That's probably the easiest way to interact with me. Uh, TechSnap fans who may still be in the channel, my new podcast is 2.5 Admins at 2.5admins.com. Uh, I recommend you check me out there. Um, the newest TechSnap is going to talk about this in more detail, but I will only be on TechSnap for two more episodes, but two and a half admins will be running indefinitely. Thanks, and uh, I appreciate everybody's attendance and questions. Have a great day.